morning and welcome to First Christian Church in Sullivan, Illinois. Thank you for joining us as we continue our online worship together during the Easter season. This season began last Sunday with Jesus' resurrection and lasts for the 50 days until Pentecost. As we begin our time of worship, a couple of announcements. Number one, the nominating team is concluding their work. Thanks to all who have said yes to serving God through this church, and thanks to all who gave a prayerful consideration. Second, our church board will be meeting virtually via email this coming week to get up to speed on the work of the church. Obviously, we are not yet able to gather in person for worship as the church building remains closed, but we're hopeful that there is light at the end of this tunnel. Finally, let's begin our time of worship with prayer. Gracious Lord, Easter was such a high point. We walked through the weeks of Lent and then boldly marched with Jesus into Jerusalem. Our steps hesitated and faltered during Holy Week when we ate with our Lord and then ran from His crucifixion. It was so hard for us to really believe in the miraculous event of Easter when our beloved Lord was raised from the dead. We like Thomas, wonder if it was real or something made up. Help us to listen to your words with our hearts and our ears. Remind us that you bring your peace to us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now you are invited to follow along with our call to worship and then join together in singing a hymn of praise.
Let's join together now in a time of prayer. Surprising God, we come to Easter through the long Lenten journey in which you have called us to examine our inner lives. Then on Easter, it is as though we have been freed from our darkness to walk in the light with you. However, Easter and its celebration so quickly slide into the past, and we are again tempted to move back into our doubts and fears. Surprise us again, Lord, as Jesus surprised his disciple Thomas, who feared and doubted. Remind us that the signs of resurrection are all around us. As we remember this day, our dear friends who suffer from illness and loss, Lord, help us to be a presence of comfort for them. For those who are lost and alone, alienated from family and friends, we ask that you empower us to reach out in compassion, offering appropriate help that will lift them into new life with you. For all anywhere who are in situations of danger, war, and strife, we pray that your peace will be with them and that the warfare and dangers will be vanquished by your good news. We pray for our community our nation, Lord, we ask that you give to the leaders compassion and wisdom, remembering that their lives rest in your care. And for ourselves, we ask for the extra measure of faith so that as doubts arise, we may meet them with confidence and emerge as strong witnesses to your love. In Christ's name, we offer this prayer. Amen. Let's now remember the prayer Jesus taught as a model for our own prayer lives. You are about to play Bible Escape Room. You're going to start in a giant mansion, and you must get out of the front door before time runs out. But to do that, you're going to have to unlock several doors. Each door needs the correct answer to a Bible riddle for it to unlock. Are you ready? Let's go! You've got 20 seconds to answer this first riddle. I disobeyed God's one wish and ended up in the belly of a fish. Who am I? I'm Jonah. Great job! You made it to the second door. You've got 20 seconds to escape. I took down a giant, and everyone said I was brave. But now, my friends and I are hiding in a cave. Who am I? I'm David. Impressive! You made it past the first two riddles, but there's another locked door. 
You've got 20 seconds to escape. I was famous for being strong, but that only lasted while my hair was long. Who am I? I'm Samson. Well done! You're making good progress. But we've got to keep going. Here's another locked door. You've got 20 seconds to escape. I prayed when the law said no one could pray. And God kept the hungry lions away. Who am I? Daniel. Wow! You're getting good at this. But can you get past this next door? You've got 20 seconds to escape. I risked my life to ask the king a question. And then I told the king about Haman's deception. Who am I? I'm Esther. Great work! These are getting harder. Can you figure out this next riddle? You've got 20 seconds. I was spending the night chained up in jail when an angel broke me out without even posting bail. I'm Peter. You're so close. There are only two doors left. Here's the next riddle. You've got 20 seconds. When my son was born, I had to lay him in the hay. Now, we celebrate his birthday on Christmas Day. Who am I? I'm Mary. This is it. You've made it to the last door. You're so close. You've got 20 seconds to answer this last riddle and break out. In my father's house, there are many rooms. You can have one because I broke out of the tomb. Who am I? I'm Jesus. Great job! You broke out! You really know your Bible characters. Way to go! My name is Thomas. And I struggle with doubt. I followed Jesus for years. From the very first day he called me. I saw things so amazing they defied explanation. I believed. But then things fell apart. I witnessed the betrayal that led to the cruel march to Calvary and his agonizing crucifixion. I survived, but everyone I knew scattered. My world collapsed. Then came news of the empty tomb, the very first Easter. But I resisted. The image of his broken, lifeless body was still burned into my memory. I experienced his death that I couldn't believe. Not until I see the scars with my own eyes and touch them with my own hands, I told the others. I wasn't ready to put my trust in something again. But Jesus came to me. He knew my doubts. He even named them. But he wasn't angry. He didn't rebuke me or dismiss me. He looked at me with those familiar eyes and offered me his scarred hands and sighed. In that moment, I experienced his resurrection and I believed. I know firsthand it's difficult to believe in what you can't see. And yet all around you are people whose lives and stories have scars that bear witness to the meaning of Easter. Yes, 
These people have been wounded, but they've experienced redemption and healing through Jesus. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were meant to rescue the doubters, the debtors, and the broken, people like you and me. He met my doubts with grace and love, and he only asked one thing of me. Believe. I'd like to share with you the story of Doubting Thomas as recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Many of us are probably familiar with the story of Thomas, doubting Thomas. Thomas, the one disciple who stubbornly refused to believe until he saw with his own eyes the risen Christ. Silly Thomas, if only he had listened to the others, but, but no, he has to see for himself. After all, seeing is believing. He has to ask questions. He has to make sure. But let's really look at Thomas. Is he really all that different from the other disciples? Let's think back to the Easter story. Mary went to the tomb and it was empty, so she ran back to Peter and John. Did they believe her? No, they went to the tomb to see for themselves. It isn't until they go inside and see the cloth and the linens lying empty in the tomb that they believe. What is it they believe though? That Jesus has risen? No, we are told they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. They return back home, knowing only that the tomb is empty. Even Mary, when Jesus appears, does not recognize him at first. And even after she does recognize him, she goes back and tells the disciples. But we are given no indication that they do anything about it. In fact, in the other gospels, it tells us that they did not believe what she told them. As Luke puts it, these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Then we get to the passage for today and what happens. The disciples are locked in a room, and Jesus comes and stands among them. Do they immediately cry out in relief? No. And then Jesus says, peace be with you. Do they immediately proclaim his resurrection? No. Then after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Are these really faithful disciples? The faithful disciples of whom Thomas is the only skeptic? No. All the disciples need proof to believe. 
all of them see Jesus, all of them hear Jesus, and all of them see the evidence of his bodily resurrection. It is only after they see this proof that they rejoice. But of course, after they believe and they tell Thomas, he still wants proof for himself. I mean, sure, no one believed Mary Magdalene, but she's only one person and not even a real disciple. But now Thomas has the word of 10 people, all of them disciples of Jesus. Why would he still doubt? Let's think about Thomas for a moment. What else do we know about him? Has he always been such a lackluster disciple? There isn't much about him in the Gospels. In fact, aside from his name appearing in the lists of disciples, there are only two other instances where Thomas is identified by name, both in the Gospel of John. One is when Jesus insists on going to Judea after the death of Lazarus. The disciples know this is not a smart move. The last time Jesus went to Judea, the Jews tried to stone him. But Jesus is determined to go. And Thomas says, let us also go, that we may die with him. This doesn't sound like the Thomas we know, the doubting Thomas, the stubborn, hard-headed one. This is a Thomas of courage and conviction. Thomas appears again in John chapter 14. Now this is more like the Thomas we know, the questioning one. Jesus is telling the disciples that he is going to prepare a place for them in his father's house and that they already know the way. Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. If you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Thomas has been told by Jesus himself that by seeing Jesus, he has seen God. So when the disciples tell him three days after the crucifixion that they have seen Jesus alive, is it any wonder he wants to see Jesus for himself? He knows what seeing Jesus means. Seeing Jesus means seeing God. Ah, yes, you might say, but he doesn't just want to see him. He says he will not believe until he does see him. But here again, we see Thomas actually being faithful to Jesus because Jesus has told the disciples, beware that you are not led astray for many will come in my name and say, I am he and the time is near. Do not go after them. Thomas will not be led astray. He's going to test. Now, you may have caught on by now that I think Thomas gets the short end of the stick in many Christian traditions. You see, I identify with Thomas. I am Thomas. I'm not one for blind faith. I'm a question asker. You see, I think a lot of us like what science has to say. Forming hypotheses, looking for evidence, questioning, testing, retesting. It's in our DNA. In fact, back when I was in seminary, like all students, I went through vocational discernment, which is the seminary's way of saying, what are you going to be when you grow up? One of the ways that mentors suggest you understand what your gifts are for ministry is to pay attention to what people compliment you on. So I started listening and found that what people told me over and over was, you ask really good questions. That's it? That's my big gift for ministry? What, what the heck am I supposed to do with that? It certainly didn't bode well for someone who thought he was called to be a pastor to stand up in a pulpit week after week and proclaim the gospel with certainty and conviction. If Jesus is asking for faith, what does it mean for someone who questions like me? What does it mean for a doubter like Thomas? One of my favorite paintings, which you've seen earlier before the message, is Caravaggio's. It's called The Incredulity of Thomas. And in it, Jesus appears to Thomas, and Thomas is leaned over looking intently at Jesus' wounds as he thrusts his finger into Jesus' side. But what is especially striking to me is that in this painting, Jesus is not viewing Thomas accusingly. He has no expression on his face that says, there, are you finally satisfied? What does it take to convince you? Rather, Jesus is looking down at Thomas and guiding his hand into the hole in his side. He offers himself as physical proof. It's true that Jesus asks, asks for faith, but he does not ask for blind faith. Jesus is willing for us to have open-eyed faith. But what about that pesky part at the end? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Okay, so Jesus forgives Thomas for wanting to make sure 
But isn't Jesus really saying that those who really believe won't need that kind of proof? The thing that we must remember here is that Thomas did not just believe what he saw. Thomas also believed what he did not see. Remember, Thomas had seen someone come back from the dead before. He was there when Jesus raised Lazarus. Being alive after being dead does not necessarily equal being God. The key for Thomas is that he knows the implications of what he has seen. He believes that Jesus is not only alive, but also is God. The other disciples rejoice at seeing Jesus alive, but Thomas is the only one that proclaims, my Lord and my God. Thomas is both the one who sees and believes that Jesus has risen, and the one who has not seen, but believes beyond seeing that Jesus is Lord. The Christian faith will always face challenges from those who claim it will not stand up to scrutiny. John says as much in his sentences right after the story of Thomas when he says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Clearly, John knows that like Thomas, we are going to need evidence for our faith, and he provides it. In a culture that seems to vacillate between on the one hand, uncritically accepting and forwarding every sensational email that comes along, especially when it strengthens our political position or confirms our long-held beliefs. And then on the other hand, skeptically crying out, that picture's photoshopped. When something seems too fantastical or challenging, we seem to be caught between blind faith and blind doubt. Perhaps it is time to let Thomas be our guide, to not be afraid to ask questions or seek evidence, God can stand up to it, but also to not be afraid to accept the amazing reality that is the resurrection, to see with open-eyed faith the confirmation of Jesus' life and the revelation that he is our Lord and our God. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts and our minds. Give us the wisdom to believe what we have seen and what we cannot see. Help us to follow you with open-eyed faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for our time of offering, we remember Jesus' words. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Your continued support of the work and ministry of the church is so appreciated, even though we're not physically present today. You can easily drop your offering in the mail. The church's address is 1357 County Road, 1200 East. You can also use the Give Now button at the top of our website to give electronically. May you continue to witness the blessings of God in your life this week. As we transition to our time of communion, I invite you to take a moment and prepare elements if you have not already done so. Whatever you have works. It doesn't have to be bread and grape juice. Let us join together in this time of communion, not because we must, but because we may. Let us sit together in humility and thanksgiving rather than in pride or possessiveness. Let us confess not that we are righteous, but that we love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to remember him. Let us come. Not that we are strong, but that we are needy. Not that we have any claim on Christ, but that he invites us to receive his grace and experience his presence. Let us worthily partake, that he may be made known to us in the breaking of bread. We're going to sing a hymn now, during which you are free to partake of the elements as you so choose.
Thank you for joining us for worship today. We will continue to gather this way in this online format until we can meet together again in person, hopefully sooner rather than later, but we will follow local government guidelines on that. And now, as we conclude our time of worship, may the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit guide you and keep you.